you know, when my ideas were being stolen, when I was getting the sheepy, which is you would say something and then they would just kind of look at you like you're talking in a, a language they don't understand. And then the guy two seats down would replicate exactly what you said, just in simpler terms. And it was the best idea ever. I told myself for the longest time, it's okay, as long as it gets in the hands of the people that need it. And that served me well for a while, but I learned that it wasn't okay. Hello, my name is MC Lassard, and welcome to Stories of Forgiveness, the podcast where you don't have to forgive, but you can. And you can also be in the process of forgiving or have made the decision not to forgive. It's all okay. There's no judgment here. This space is a safe space. It is because I want to hear all of your stories. In every episode, I have guests who have the courage and the generosity to share their path along the forgiveness journey. And every story has its own gem. So you listen to one and you'll want to listen to the others. And this one is no different. So stay tuned. In today's episode, I have Nicole Belanger as a guest. Nicole is a retired chief warrant officer from the Canadian Armed Forces and served 35 years as a military police. Nicole reached that rank and served at the highest level of our defense organization, despite the fact that she was a lesbian. She was just on the tail end of the purge which I have come to learn that was a period between the 1950s and the early 1990s where there was an SIU, Special Investigations Unit, who actually hunted down the homosexuals in the Canadian Armed Forces because they were apparently a threat to our country. This said, Nicole was dedicated to serving her country. She was committed to doing that for all of her professional career. And that is what she did, but it did come at a cost. And today she shares with us what that cost was. And of course, how she was called to forgive others as well as herself in the process. Hello, Nicole. Hi, MC. How are you today? I'm doing amazing. How about you? I'm very good. Thank you. You know, it is a real delight and absolute privilege to have you today on the podcast. So thank you for coming to Stories of Forgiveness. Thank you for having me. It is uh, absolutely my pleasure to be here today, you know, to speak with you because not only is it going to help others, but it's certainly helpful in my journey as well. Yeah. So I hear sometimes from my other guests, that's what they tell me. They come to the show knowing, thinking that they've forgiven, but just to have the conversation just kind of deepens the healing or the, you know, whatever progress on your own journey. So that's, uh, we can expect that to happen. Yeah. 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 Did you know that today we're being pioneers? Like, and, and I mean, you're, you're not new to pioneering. So <laughs> but you are pioneering again today. I did not know that. No. Because you are my first guest on the English version of the podcast. Oh, well, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Yes. And my apologies to Tintly Francophone kids. May I should probably have to have a conversation in Francais. All forgiven. <laughs> okay. You're in the right spot. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. So how about you give us a little bit of context to what it is that you experienced and that called you to forgive? Um. So... When I was growing up, I, I lived in a um, very toxic uh, family environment where my father was um, quite abusive, verbally, physically, mentally. And we lived with that for the majority of our life. Um, and then as a to make matters worse, when I was five years old, I realized that I was a lesbian. And while I didn't know what that meant at the time, this was in the late 60s, I knew there was something wrong with me. and soon everyone figured it out that this was this deep secret that i was hiding and to make matters worse all i wanted to do was join the canadian armed forces and they didn't want me either because i was an aberration and it was during the lgbtq purge that you know i wanted to join this organization that i had coveted my entire life where did this inspiration to join the military come from 
I don't know if it was, you know, when I was born because I, I uh, was almost born on the Sir John A. Macdonald Bridge. But I like to say, you know, I got a, uh, I got a police escort going across the bridge because my mother was ready to have me on the bridge, and it was during rush hour. No way. Yeah. So my father's in a taxi trying to throw the money into the basket to get across the bridge back then, and and he kept missing. And of course, the military police were at the head of the bridge just laughing at him so anyway they finally gave him an escort they felt bad for him and i i knew before i came out of the womb that this is what i wanted to be and my father was also in the military and back then i when i was little he was kind of my hero but i quickly realized when i was able to formulate the thoughts of what was going on that he wasn't so much as a hero as he was a villain because anyone that's supposed to love you can't hurt you or should not hurt you one minute and then try and love you the next minute so i joined the military uh, you know for my entire life up to that point i had to hide my authentic self and then hide my authentic self going into the military as well and from the day i entered so i wasn't quite sure if sometimes what was the greater sin was it being a lesbian or was it being a woman oh really what is it on the woman's side and what is it on the lesbian side that would have made you feel that there was some prejudice being done to a part of your identity or another part of your identity? So when, of course, you know, being a lesbian was not accepted back then, you there was thought to be something wrong with you that, you know, this was a choice that you could just choose to not like the same sex or, or whatever that, you know, you were just doing this to act out or whatever. But we all know that that's not the case. It's the same as you growing up and, and knowing that you were a heterosexual. Like nobody taught you that. And nobody taught me how to be a homosexual. It's just who I was. And then that was okay when I joined the military because I joined during that period where we were thought to be a threat to security of the Canadian forces and we were, you know, hunted by the military police. That was the big sin. But as it became more accepted and people started to understand we are not spies against the Canadian forces, that we are not these aberrations. And as I rose in rank, the sin became being a woman because you were not wanted up there. You were not wanted at the highest rank levels. You didn't deserve to be there you were a threat to the patriarchy. You know, at times I, I just wasn't sure uh, which one was the greater sin. And I had to learn to to deal with those those things. And I think that's where, you know, the forgiveness piece came in. And for a lot of things, I didn't understand the forgiveness path. You know, forgiveness means different things to different people. And for me, I let go of the anger and the resentment that I was holding against certain people, but there were certain people that I couldn't forgive. And those certain people were myself and my father. Okay. You know, I can never forget what my father did to his children and to his wife, but I hope to eventually forgive him. As of today, you have forgiven many people who wronged you, harmed you, but you have not forgiven yourself nor your father. Correct. Yeah, up to this point. And you know, at, like when I was going through my 35 years in the military, I um, I had some bad stuff happen to me, just like, you know, most women in the Canadian Forces that joined during that period, whereby we weren't wanted, whereby, you know, we were entering into a male domain. And I was, you know, sexually assaulted. I was sexually harassed. I was made to feel like I didn't belong, made to feel like I was stupid, always questioned, had to work three times harder to get that path, trying to earn the same things that men were given, all the microaggressions, the unconscious biases against you. Uh, I had let all that go, or at least I thought I did. I had shoved it down and shoved it down and shoved it down because all I wanted to do was serve the Canadian forces and be a role model and make change. And so I kept it down. And I didn't realize the harm it was doing to myself and to my family and to those around me. And for the most part, I thought I was very successful at presenting this package that was this altogether woman that was out to make change in the Canadian forces and, and had your back and did all this great stuff. When my reality was that that wasn't me, that wasn't who I was. But that's what I allowed other people to think and to see. 
And, you know, one person said to me, I thought you were my friend and I thought I knew you, but I only knew what you allowed me to see. And that is so true because I kept all that down. When I got to the highest rank for non-commissioned members in the Canadian Forces, I thought all that would change. I thought I would have a voice. I thought I could be this freedom fighter that, that I always saw myself as being, and I couldn't, and it was worse. And I was like, where I should have had the most voice and, it, and you know, sing from the, the rooftops, I was silenced. I was silenced because they didn't want me there. And that hatred was palpable. I was just like, I, I don't understand. I got here the same way you did. And, and perhaps it was more difficult. And for three years, I put up with this misogynistic behavior and this just outright hatred of me that finally my trauma expired and everything came pouring out. Thus, my book, which was pretty cathartic for me. But then that's what started me down the forgiveness path. So the people that harmed me, I have forgiven. People that didn't know any better, I've forgiven. You went to therapy? I did go to therapy, yeah. I went to very extensive cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. When I fell apart in my doctor's office, and my doctor in the military, thank God I got her in my last couple of years, was phenomenal. And she asked me one question that nobody had ever asked me before. And, you know, it was like acid in my stomach and coming up through my esophagus. And I was shoving it back down and shoving it back down. And she looked at me one day. We were, I was in her office and she asked me a question and I just lost it. And I curled up in my chair in the fetal position and I just cried. And it was like a release. Those tears were washing over me and that process started right then and there in her office. That was after what, 33, 34 years of service? 34 years of service. And thank God for her because there was a national crisis for getting a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. There was like a six to seven month wait. And this woman had me into help and into therapy in a week. She literally saved my life because in those two years, every time I had to go to a meeting with two of these individuals that were on that inner council that I was on, that basically dictated the future of chief warrant officers in the Canadian Forces, I just wanted to kill myself. I wanted to, for anyone that's familiar with the Ottawa and the 417, drive my car into the barrier. So. That day, those tears almost became like a washcloth and they washed over me. And then I got into therapy and this lady was not easy on me either. She could tell when I was trying to avoid a subject. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, she would call me out and um, she made me dig down deep into some feelings that I, I hadn't talked about, never spoke out loud. Even my wife never knew what I went through in the Canadian Forces. And she was always like, you got to go on. I, and I was tired and I just wanted to quit. And she was like, no, no, people need you. You know, you got to help these people. You got to do this, you got to do that. I couldn't even help myself, let alone help other people. That process started that day. While uh, it looks different for different people, like I said, I can't forget what he did. Meaning? My father and what he did to us. But I hope to eventually forgive him. And uh, now I, that I've moved to Kelowna, I have a new psychologist that we are working on the forgiveness part for him. Because I got the other parts down pat. So what made it possible for you to forgive the others who wronged you? Because they didn't know any better. Okay. That was the culture at the time, and that's what they were being taught. And when people look up, they expect to see what right looks like, so they replicate that behavior. And unfortunately, when those people were looking up, you have to remember that in the 80s, it was a very misogynistic, patriotic environment. Only men fought wars. You know, this was a an organization that attracted the dominant type, A-type personality, hard-charging male. And you had to be that to survive, just to survive. So I tried to be that, and that's not me. But I played that role, and I played it very well. To survive. Yeah, to survive, exactly. I've realized that they didn't know any better. 
they were afraid, especially in the beginning, where, you know, is homosexuality a disease that you can catch? Wow. They're they're probably getting pressure at home, especially for me as a military police officer, and you're riding in a car with a male counterpart, like, what are their wives saying? Like, they don't know. And, and, and they just, like I said, they just didn't know any better, or they were afraid, or they were uneducated. And I can forgive that. And the two at the very top, I just look back and go, the system allowed you to get there when you should never have been there to start with. And you felt threatened because I actually deserved to be there. I earned my way there. I'm not sure you earned yours. And I think you felt threatened by that. And in order for you to promote your dominancy over me, you used those fears inside me because I think you could sniff them out to put me down to ensure that I knew my place because you had a higher position than I did or a higher appointment. Again, you know what? That's forgivable and you didn't know any better. What's not forgivable, in my opinion, is my father. And this is where we're starting to get into the root of it is that he grew up in a time where it was expected you got married, but you had kids. Maybe he should never have had them, but there was so much pressure on him to have them that he didn't know what to do. And he was mimicking the behavior from his father. Is that how he grew up as well in a home that was not safe? Yes. So we always try and do better by our children. My mother always said, you know, he was a great provider, but he was a terrible father. And his father was not a good father, nor was he a good provider, nor a good husband. So at least my father hit one out of the three. So we're working on that. Intergenerational trauma takes generations to heal, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm so happy to be having this conversation with you today because I thought that I could not forgive myself uh, and forget what I did to my family or my subordinates. But I've started down that road to recovery, you know, simply by acknowledging what I did and taking responsibility for those actions. And I think, you know, part of my book does that. I was in a toxic environment, but I was also one of the toxic ones. However, having said that, a very astute woman whose name is Sandra Perron told me that I needed to forgive what I did as a younger version of myself because it isn't fair to judge myself by the standards I have of me today. And while that's such a simple statement, her saying that and what she had been through hit me like a ton of bricks. I did have a hand in, you know, ending some people's careers simply because I couldn't speak up. But nobody knew that because it's all behind closed doors. And for her to say to me, that was a younger version of you and you had to do that to survive just to walk away with half of your being still intact. Not that it gave me a pass, but it helped me to validate why I did what I did. Yeah, and she told me essentially that if I didn't forgive myself, I'd continue to live in the past. And that's not good for anyone. And I don't want to live in the past. Uh, you know, I had this nasty habit of denying that I hurt, you know, hurt someone. But I did it to everyone, and, and especially my loved ones. I now know that if someone tells me that I hurt them, it's not my prerogative to decide whether I did or I didn't hurt them. I have to allow them to explain how I hurt them and understand that I did and not to provide an excuse because that's not my prerogative. So I found it very interesting and it was so timely because we're starting off in a new year and my psychiatrist and I are, are getting to that pivotal point where we're discussing my father and we're discussing me and I want to feel like I can shed this suit of armor that I used to keep on myself all the time and only take it off at night and when nobody was around and then drink myself into a stupor and allow myself to feel the hurt and the pain and the suffering and I guess the feeling sorry for myself piece of it and then I, you know I would put it back on and I would go to bed and then I would wake up and I would start this journey all over again. I don't want to wear that suit anymore. It was cumbersome. It was heavy. And I've now taken it off and I never, ever want to put it on again. So I think that's the piece that allows me to start this journey of forgiveness because it's a strange thing. You know, sometimes it, it's funny because it's easier to forgive our enemies than our friends. 
and it's hardest of all to forgive those that that we love that you know do you harm do you think it's because we have higher expectations of them and of ourselves i do yeah i really do and i think too it's it it's hard and it's a painful process because it forces you to examine your true self or their true selves and it isn't always what your mind's eye sees my mom raised me to be better than how i grew up to be and she raised me not to lie, cheat, and steal, and I did every one of those things. Um, so that's not how I wanted to see myself in my mind's eye, but that's why it's so painful. Because you have to look internally, and, and you have to be truthful to yourself. I think you also have to recognize your emotions and then get really, really honest with, in my case, the stories that I made up about events that, that caused that hurt for me. You know, like I would make these events up that didn't hurt just to cover up that pain. That's difficult. Yeah. And one of the needs that we have as humans is to be coherent. We were able to script ourselves into coherence just like a smoker smokes, knowing that it's really bad for your health. And there's these very stark images that says that it will give you pulmonary cancer to X percentage of, you know, risk. But mm -hmm. the person who smokes will say, this is my time for me. This is when I relax. Yeah. This, you know, so they, they mm. rationalize it because it's the only way, because they wouldn't be able to take the cigarette, put it in their mouth and say, this is really bad for me. I'm killing myself again and enjoy it. They couldn't. Yeah. So to be able to enjoy it, they have to rationalize it. And so we have this tendency to do that in all areas of our lives. And of course we do it unconsciously because if we knew better, we would do better. Do you think, because I knew better. But, you know, there were times I didn't do better. I, I kind of look at it more as having uh, almost like two sides of the same coin. There's the decisional side and then there's the emotional side of it. Yes. The decisional side being the more conscious choice. Absolutely. Yeah, to replace it with like the good part of it, right? So, yes. um, and then the emotional side being so much harder. And I think, you know, that piece takes much longer to accomplish. You're right. And what I mean when we say we, if we knew better, I'm not only referring to the knowledge of this is bad for me and this is good for me. It's the knowledge. If I'm feeling this way, mm -hmm. this is not good for me. While you were going into a meeting where you were being interrupted, yeah. where your ideas were being stolen, even if you knew that that was going on and a part of you felt angry, mm -hmm. probably, you know, just so upset and mm -hmm. resentful, you had to show restraint because of course, then they would have thought that you were irrational if you came out and oh, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> there was no way for you to win. No, there's not. And you know, uh, God forbid a woman shows emotions, then you're weak. A man shows emotions. Oh, well, you know, he's in touch with his uh, feelings and, you know, he's a really good leader because he can relate. Yeah. And the double standards. Yeah, it's a huge double standard. But you're right. You know, when my ideas were being stolen, when I was getting the sheepy, which is you would say something and then they would just kind of look at you like you're talking in a a language they don't understand and then the guy two seats down would replicate exactly what you said just in simpler terms and it was the best idea ever i told myself for the longest time it's okay as long as it gets in the hands of the people that need it and that served me well for a while but i learned that it wasn't okay and i didn't learn that until i started to examine my trauma and it wasn't okay because it stung you can get so many pats on the back but eventually that slap on the back starts to sting it wasn't okay part of it was that if it got into the hands of the people that needed it then that was great but there is not one thing in the that i leave this canadian forces with that has my name on it and while it sounds like i'm being selfish and perhaps i am I just wanted credit for work done. I just wanted what my male counterparts got. And I shouldn't have had to fight so hard and carry so much weight to get what I deserved and to get exactly what they got. Even to this day, that still irks me a bit because other women are going to have to fight through that. And that's what I tried 
to change. Even though I was going through it at the same time, I was trying to make sure that these women didn't have to carry those rocks in their rucksack because that rucksack gets so heavy at times. But I believe we're getting there and that's where I can hold the institution to what it is that I love about this organization. I I would do it all over again. I would serve another 35 years if I could. And I told you this earlier, I've never worked a day in my life. When you do something you love, I don't call it work. And I loved being in the military. I loved putting that uniform on every day. I loved serving with the people that I served with. And I certainly loved defending my country because that's all I ever wanted to do. Wow. Nicole, is there a difference for you between letting go and forgiving? Um, that's a very good question. I think so. I think there is a difference. Forgetting and and letting go that hurt is okay for others, like others that are not close to me, others that they didn't have a, a moral obligation not to hurt me. I think my father had a moral and an ethical obligation not to harm me, and he did it anyway. So, yeah, I think there is a little bit of a difference. Okay. As you move forward in terms of your self-forgiveness, what is it that you think you'll need to get there? A lot more understanding of, you know, what forgiveness entails, because it is a huge subject that um, I don't think there's enough study done on it so far. And while... You can say that you forgive and you forget, but until we thoroughly understand what that means to our psyche, to everything that's been done to us, like I'll never get my health back from holding in all this stress, all this anxiety, you know, for 35 years, I'll never get that back. And to me, this is where the difference comes in, right? I am very angry about that because I can't live out my golden years with with my wife. I'm not going to make it to them. I gave my best to the Canadian forces and that was taken away from me from my golden years because of something that somebody who didn't know any better did to me. And because I wasn't allowed to speak my truth for fear of being kicked out, for fear of being the weak link, for being ostracized, all those fears, be they irrational or whatever, the reality is I don't have that time left. Mm Mm-hmm. So your health has been eroded? Oh, my goodness. I have every disease known to man that can be related to anxiety. I have a reflux so bad when I get stressed like that I literally have to throw up to get anything down. I have an aneurysm in my neck. I have peripheral artery disease. I have coronary artery disease. I have restless leg syndrome. I have complex PTSD. I have PTSD anxiety depression. I'm on so many pills that some days I don't know which way is up. And, you know, I live in a trance. That's not good, right? So we're trying to get off those and cutting back on the PTSD medication so that I can live my life. You know, I I won't get the other stuff back. And all this came to light, most of it anyway, when I was leaving. And the fact that, you know, I was a person who I had done posting after posting after posting and sometimes they'd be a year sometimes they'd be two years like since 2007 I did 12 postings that has to take a toll it does and I talk about this because you chase doctors no continuity in your medical file there is nothing right so in 2003 I went to Jakarta Indonesia And my feet started to fall asleep all the time. And I couldn't figure it out. I came home and in four years, I never had a medical. And it took them another three years and me screaming and hollering to figure out that I had peripheral artery disease. My femoral arteries were blocked from stress. At the time, they operated, but they also found coronary artery disease, but nobody told me that. And I didn't know it until my last couple of years when I got my med file. I was on high blood pressure medication, cholesterol medication, and I was put on entry-level meds. And those medications I was on for 10 years. Nobody bothered to check. Despite the fact that every time I would go to a doctor, my blood pressure would be through the roof. And they would say, oh, you just have white coat syndrome. Which is? Fear of a doctor. Oh, really? Yeah. So it causes your blood pressure to rise. Oh. So I stayed on entry-level meds 
that were doing no good for 10 years. I had a heart attack, didn't know it. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, that piece, when you ask, is there a difference between forgiveness and forgetting? Well, I, I said letting go. Oh, letting go. Excuse me. Yeah, letting go. Letting go is not forgetting because I don't think we should ever forget yeah. anything. I think we should learn from it. We can heal from it. I don't think we can ever forget it. Yeah. So I have to let that go. I, and all I can do now is, I guess, maybe no, there's not then. You know, this is just dawning on me because I can't forget, but I have realized that this is what I'm left with and I've got to make the best of what I have left in my life for my wife's sake. Because for 35 years, she allowed me to put the military first and she waited and she waited and she waited and now it's her turn and she's feeling shortchanged, but I can't shortchange her, right? So I have to let that go. I have to live the life that I've been given. You know, I've forgiven the medical system and because it's not the medical system's fault. You know, I was posted. I was needed. I had a skill that was needed in other places and we were easy to move around. So we were the easy button to push and that's okay because that's what's called service before self. And I don't harbor any guilt or any resentment for putting service first because that's what I joined to do. I joined to serve, not to be served. So no, I guess there is no difference for me, mm. but I, I don't forget. Yeah. Yeah. And I want us to kind of wrap this up with your book that I read, as you know, from cover to cover in a very short time. And Pride Amid Prejudice is very well written. So kudos to you. And it is written in a way that it brought me to tears. It brought up the anger in me. It made me chuckle at some points and it just made me shake my head you know, seriously at other points. And I could just imagine myself in the room where you were experiencing what you were experiencing. And of course, I have no idea how it was really for you, but you gave me a sense of how it might have felt. And so I have to think that anybody who's going to put the hands on this book will be able to learn from it and to grow from it. And perhaps they will themselves be able to forgive whoever they need to forgive, whether it's themselves or others who may have wronged them. And so I want you to know that your voice is probably loudest now than it has ever been. And I thank you for the courage of sharing your story. Thank you so much. You just brought me to tears. Yay! <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> In a very good way. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, you talked about Sandra Perron a little bit earlier, who made the difference between the young Sandra and the older Sandra and the young Nicole and the now Nicole. And she would know what she's talking about because she also wrote a great book and has also experienced her own, yeah. her own slice of yeah. injustice, to say the least. Yeah. But those, in, those injustices help make the institution better. Because you said it earlier, when we know better, we do better. And for that, I agree in that as long as we can bring these to light and people can learn and they take those lessons, because a lot of times we don't learn from our lesson. We call them lessons learned, but we don't learn. I think the military is learning and that behavior is no longer acceptable. So women coming up, women joining today, women who are now in leadership roles don't have to suffer through what we did. And for that, it was worth it. It was worth going through all of the pain in writing that book. It was worth every last tear, every last, you know, pull your hair out. It was worth it because now, and thank you so much for saying what you said about my voice is the loudest now. If I can help one person, then I did my job and I can rest easy. And that's what I wish for you. Well, thank you so much. And just thank you for having me. My life is blessed having met you. And um, just having had the opportunity to sit and chat with you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Nicole. See you Take next care. time. Okay. Bye. bye. In this episode, you heard Nicole talk about her really harsh life experience and the havoc it wreaked on her health. As I listened to her list the ways in which her mind and body were affected, the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza came to me. If you don't know who Dr. Joe is, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you check out the links in the episode notes. He's written a number of New York Times bestsellers, namely You Are the Placebo, Making Your Mind Matter. 
I just love what he does. He is a, well, in addition to an author, he is a researcher, a lecturer, and he hosts retreats where people have some pretty amazing healings. And in case that you're wondering how he came to his method, well, Dr. Joe was a triathlete back in the 1980s when some of us were back combing our bangs and he got hit by a truck during an event. He fractured six vertebrae and was told he would never walk again. Fast forward almost, what, 40 years and he is walking, he is in full form and he is doing just outstanding, inspiring work. There are a bunch of testimonials on YouTube If you are not convinced, I don't expect you to take my word for it. Go check him out. But if you are into into mind-body healing through meditation, maybe this will be up your alley. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't yet, please go ahead and click that subscribe button or like, share, comment. That's how we get to more subscribers and we can share the love even more. See you in the next episode. Bye for now.